tres. Okay, um, can anybody hear me? Anyone? Or oh, everyone hear me? Perfect. Okay, so I, I have the pleasure to give him the last talk to uh, wrap up this really nice conference. So for, um, I think most of it was 14 days of uh, learning a lot of new things. And uh, I also had to change my presentation a little bit because of the things I learned to, uh, during the 14 days, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So uh, my topic is um, traffic slowdown by antibiotics. And my PhD, mainly, we're mainly interested in how translation limitation can change the cell physiology and how one can model this with non-equilibrium um, traffic models. So let's um, kind of start from the translation cycle. So I think most of us are familiar, but you have the initiation of the um, ribosomes to on the mRNA, and then you have multiple steps that are kind of a lot of times coarse-grained, but you have the tRNA binding, you have the peptide bond formation, and then the translocation. And so this gets repeated until you reach the stop codon. Once you get to the stop codon, you have the termination, which then um, results in a hopefully functional protein, and then you have a recycling step. So now, typically, a lot of the talks are about chloramphenicol, but there are actually a lot more antibiotics that inhibit different uh, steps. And so uh, for a good starting point, it's chloramphenicol, though, so this is where I'm, I'm going to focus on. So just to clarify, CM is chloramphenicol, and it acts on peptide bond formation and also termination, like this. Yes. Um, so what is the idea? So, oh, yeah, no. The, so, yes, so the, this is the kind of the um, plot that we've seen now a lot. And, uh, but we, most talks were mainly about the first growth law and not the second. So we're especially interested in why the second growth law goes up. So in this uh, paper from Diet et al. in 2016, there was this, they measured this really nicely and they measured a lot of elongation rates, but what they also measured was how elongation rate changes with chloramphenicol. And as, you showed you, as I showed you before, in the, uh, the chloramphenicol stops the ribosome, so it pauses the ribosome. What was really puzzling for me is, once you treat uh, chlorine with chloramphenicol, elongation rate actually goes up. And one goal of today is kind of to give you an intuitive and use our model, hopefully, to, to convince you that uh, this makes sense. <laughs> and so the general idea of our model is that you can have um, antibiotics that uh, bind with a certain rate K plus to the ribosome, and then the ribosome enters a pause state, and once it's paused, it unbinds with the rate K minus, which then it resumes um, elongation. So this type of model has been mainly used to um, study RNAPs and transcription, because RNA, uh, RNA polymerases have been known to pause uh, sometimes. So because uh, um, we, we use the, so our, our little bit the, the traffic model part of it is, Luca gave a great talk on Tuesday introducing this, but you basically have a one-dimensional lattice where particles can enter with the rate alpha, and they unidirectionally hop along this lattice with a certain rate uh, epsilon, and they obtain the um, exclusion principle so they can't occupy the same site. So now the adaption of this model is that we, um, our particles can enter a pause state. So what we effectively do is we induce traffic jams. And I want to clarify a little bit what you see on top. So for me, active, when I talk about active particles, are the ones that can actually move. Pause particles are the ones that are bound by the antibiotic. And the jammed particles are then the ones that cannot move. And they are um, because of exclusion principles. So from this, we can kind of get the protein synthesis rate. And we can also get the density. And here's just a small uh, depiction of what then for me an active jammed and pause particle looks like. Um, just to give you kind of a um, quick overview of how these things work in different regimes. So on the y-axis, we have um, unpausing rate. And on the uh, x-axis, we have uh, pausing rate. So the higher you go on the, on the y-axis, the faster you unpause. And the faster, you, when you go to the right, the faster, uh, the more pausing you have, so more pause particles you have. So if we start with very fast unpausing and not a lot of pause particles, 
we kind of get like to the standard TASEP regime where we really have this nice parabola and we get a nice maximum at a density of one half. And for me, intuitively, this means you have the maximal current when every other particle, every other side is occupied by a particle, so they can really nicely move slowly. So now if you increase the pausing rate, you get like a lot of transient short pauses, which it looks the same, but the y-axis is different. So you kind of rescale it with the elongation rate. Now the bottom right graph, now it gets a little bit worse for the uh, cell, let's say, or for the protein production, because now you, de you, you decrease the unpausing rate, which basically your entire system gets stuck, and again, the y-axis, you have a big decrease. So the most interesting part, or where you really start to introduce correlations, is in this regime. Because now when you decrease the pausing rate, so you have very rare pauses, but if they pause, they stay there for a long time, this then creates long traffic jams. And uh, one might ask, where does chlorine phenical fall into all of this? Because as you can see, the theory really matches up in three regimes, and it uh, basically goes to all the way to the lower left. So chlorine phenical has a really long pausing time, and it has also a very low um, uh, pausing rate. So what I mean by this is that it, it rarely binds, and if it binds, it stays there for a long time. Uh, yes, please. Uh, so, so there, there, there are multiple reasons for this, and uh, one reason is because in these, um, so this formula here on top is basically the standard TASEP, and this relies on mean field, and mean field, you basically say, okay, we feel a constant, uh, uh, all interactions are kind of constant, and so uh, once you introduce really correlations, then it kind of all goes down the drain. Um, and because we have actually have a huge time scale separation, there's also something more going on, and we'll talk about it on the next slide in a moment. So we, uh, an intern worked, uh, or an, a master's student worked on this, but it's a work in progress because he left <laughs> after the, yes. So the, both the on and off rates are many of orders of magnitude smaller than the elongation yes, rate. Yes, yes. Many, many orders of, uh, it, uh, it's, it's just blowing my mind. So, yes, uh, yes, uh, 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 yeah, <laughs> and it's, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it really is many orders of magnitude different. So, because what is the hopping rate? Um, so the hopping rate is depending on where you, what you say, t 10 amino acids per second. Okay, so it's 0.1 per second, so these things are, it takes an hour for this thing to come yes. off once it's bound. Or uh, a, a minute. Several hours yeah. for it. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, because, no. because I, I, wait. No hours. Maybe I missed K an order of magnitude there. K minus epsilon is 10 to the minus 4. You 10 to the minus 1 is epsilon. So K minus is 10 to the minus 3. That's 1,000 seconds, right? That's 20, 20 Yes, minutes. yes. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I might have, I think what I read in the paper was orders of minutes. So I might have screwed up the order of mag one order of magnitude here. I have to go, I have to ah. double check. But even, even minutes, it's, it's much longer than uh, several minutes. And it takes an order for an antibiotic, an hour for an antibiotic to find then a... That a, 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 a ribosome to bind yes. to. So the, the number that I give here, I should have mentioned this, is that the, um, it depends on the uh, uh, concentration. So you, you have, this is for uh, um, one micromolar of chlorine phenical. And so you can, typically the experiments are between uh, 1 and 12, so you would go one order of magnitude up as well. But yes, in general, it's really you have a big one time. One micromolar is one molecule per cell, roughly, right? I don't know. Sure. I, Even more. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Then, yeah. the, how, why does it take it so long to find the ribosome? I, if somebody could answer that question, I would love to hear the answer because I, the, the, uh, I, I also, um, to be com completely honest here, I also don't quite know how they measure these rates. Um, I took them from the oh, I probably should, I took them from the Terry Was group from the Diet All paper. Um, 
But yeah, if, if, uh, if there's any one in this room that, that have an idea about these, I would love to talk to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Um, oh yes, yes. So the the typically a lot of these um, traffic models you kind of start with even the simplest model where you have just periodic boundary conditions and your particle go around in a circle and you just set the density. And then there's a mapping between periodic and open boundaries, which you can use. But because of the time scale separation, we, we, we have a problem. And Lorenzo worked on this uh, thing. Um, and we can see that our solution is better than the one given in the literature. But if we for periodic boundary conditions, but there are a couple of problems for the open boundary conditions. And it's a work in progress. So if anybody wants to dive in the mathematics, I can try to explain to you. But we'll, we'll see how far we can go. Okay, so going back to the, the, to the system, and it kind of touches a little bit on, on Eric's thing. So one thing that comes out of that you have not, that it takes really long to find the ribosome and bind, is that you have a lot of ribosomes that can basically finish the trans uh, translation without being paused. So you have kind of a state where you have normal current. Then one time you get a pause, and now you stay there for a really long time. And this then creates traffic jams. And in order for this one lattice or this one mRNA to go back, it has to basically resolve the cluster piece by piece to go back to the, let's say, normal state. So this is just for one mRNA molecule. If you do this for m mRNA molecules, you kind of get a fraction of active mRNAs and a fraction of bound mRNAs, which gives you the concentration of bound mRNAs. So you add the um, free ribosome concentration, which kind of determines your initiation rate. Um, and then this gives you the total ribosome concentration. So uh, yeah, and this is the, then the initiation rate with alpha on times the free ribosome concentration. So the next comment, on these orders of time scale, degradation probably matters for two reasons, just because M degradation of mRNA. One is that it seems to be the, 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 the common knowledge that you have exposed when you have exposed mRNAs, that is typically where RNAases attack and uh, degrade the, the mRNAs. Uh, and the other one is just the pure time scale of the, these things. Um, so then if we want to, now we kind of know the protein production. So we can write uh, down how the uh, number of proteins changes with time. And we can relate the growth rate with the current. Uh, one other important ingredient that Rosanna uh, touched on a little bit is the flux balance. So the uh, flux balance is kind of um, how your metabolic proteins, depending on your nutrients, create uh, precursors with a certain nutrient efficiency mu. And these nutrients get um, incorporated into protein via protein synthesis. So writing this down mathematically just means that you have this influx of nutrients and the outflux of nutrients, and they have to be equal to, because you assume balanced growth, the, the, um, the growth rate times the number of uh, precursors. Solving this, we can get, go get to the nutrient efficiency, um, where basically on the bottom um, it's, it's phi, phi C, but a lot of times we assume uh, that the Q sector that Lozana mentioned is, uh, is, is constant, so we can replace things. It's, it's not uh, the most important thing. So we, we use an ansatz that basically says, OK, we have a certain concentration of tRNA, and that gets upregulated with the um, ribosome fraction. So if you have more ribosomes, you need more tRNA, uh, precursors. If we uh, so plug this in, we can kind of re relate the phi r to the um, growth rate. And one thing that I wanted to point out is if you decrease your lambda here, you basically um, uh, your phi r becomes your phi r max, and that's why you get this, this, this slope in the end. OK, so how do we do this numerically? Um, oh, yeah, sorry, the answer, that's the, the justification. So if you look at how long it takes for the ribosome to translate one codon, it is 1 over epsilon, which is the elongation rate, is equal to the time it takes the um, precursors to get there, plus the translocation, which for us is epsilon max. If you rearrange things, you can put it in this nice Michaelis Menten form. And with our ansatz, we, we, we get something that looks like this. And then um, Terry showed this plot um, last week, I think on Tuesday. 
Um, and this kind of uh, fits it nicely, but of course it's a, it's a fit. <laughs> so how do we do this? Um, oh, one thing that I wanted to point out, which, which I really think is really fascinating, that nutrient and translation limitation actually collapse on the same line if you look at elongation rate and ribosome fraction. Um, so yeah, again, if anybody has an in intuition, please talk to me. Uh, so let's, let's start with the numerical approach. So we, we basically choose our starting condition. So we have a certain phi r and a certain lambda. We use the um, Balakrishna data to set our concentration of mRNAs, which for purpose um, of the second growth loss stays constant. We can get our nutrient condition. And then we can also, with the phi r and lambda, we can also get our starting initiation rate. And this initiation rate, uh, Luca talked about on, uh, on Tuesday, but we infer this from the, from the data above, and we're using alpha on. So now uh, we kind of need the elongation rate uh, epsilon as well. And from there, if we know how, many, how fast we initiate onto the uh, on the mRNAs and how fast we go, we, can, we know the density, so we know the bound ribosomes. With the bound ribosomes, we know the free. And with that, we know the alpha on, which also doesn't we keep constant from here on out. Okay, so now the cell happy and uh, nice, and so you have these normal pictures. Now you start to introduce antibiotics. And so now antibiotics basically really start, uh, you start to cluster these, um, these mRNAs, and they kind of soak up the free ribosome, right? Because you keep your phi r or your uh, total ribosome concentration the same. And so you suck up your, um, uh, the ribosomes get stuck on the mRNA, you increase the density. So this changes alpha, because alpha depends on the free ribosome concentration. So we get a new alpha to rerun the simulations again. So we're kind of trying to find a, numeric, uh, a steady state numerically. We do this until alpha doesn't change anymore. So in a sense, we, um, and the only thing that changes here in this equation is uh, the free ribosome concentration. So as, as if we find numerically a, a state where the free ribosome concentration doesn't change, we accept it. It just occurred to me with these very long time scales, right, that essentially what is happening is that most ribosomes make it from initiation to completion without anything happening, then every once in a while one gets hit, and it basically blocks that mRNA. Yes, exactly, right? yes. And then it's blocked, that mRNA is basically taken out. Yes, yes. And uh, so, so is that part of the model that the mRNAs have a certain length and they're degraded? Or I, I yes, yes, so, so, so uh, uh, the, uh, we, haven't, we don't consider degradation, we definitely have to. And I think with this is, uh, yeah, the, the length, we assume it's uh, around 250, that's just an average length. But yeah, it's, it's very possible that the length really plays a role in depending how uh, susceptible it is to actually uh, be hit by an um, antibiotic, to, to have a pausing. Um, yes, but so now with the, our new um, alpha, we, 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 we get our, uh, so now the free ribosome concentration is fixed. We get our new alpha and now the, because of flux balance, the cell senses with, with a lot of regulatory mechanism, PBGPP is probably involved, that um, the flux is imbalanced. So it changes, it re reallocates its proteome. Um, and so we, now we have a new proteome, we have a new ribosome concentration, but that also means again that our uh, initiation rate changes again, right? Because we, now we have a lot more ribosomes in the system, and so we have to rerun this whole thing again. Once alpha doesn't change, we accept it as our new lambda, we accept the new phi r, and then we do this until our proteome and our growth rate doesn't change anymore. So, um, and so once, once we get there, we, we kind of have the first point, and we increase our antibiotic concentration from there on out, and we get something that looks like this. So I still haven't really talked to you about what happens to the elongation rate, with our ansatz, right, if, if phi r goes up, the elongation rate also goes up. What for me is, um, 
let's call it a little bit more remarkable. And so yeah, and then you choose different initial conditions and you get different things. For me, what was also really remarkable about this is that the slope is different. So for poor nutrient conditions, you really start to increase. For poor nutrient conditions with low growth rate, you have a really sharp increase. And that, that slope time tends to go away a little bit. So just to, 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 to finish this, this, this up, so the, the idea is that if, if you're in a low growth state, you have, you're kind of limited by the arrival of the tRNA, by the precursors to move. And um, for high growth rate, you're saturated. So now once you add the, uh, the antibiotics, you really decrease the amount of active particles. So essentially, you have more precursors for less ribosomes. Because also, um, phi R goes up, so you have also have more precursors. So you have the two effects. You have more precursors and less active ribosomes. That means all the other ribosomes speed up. Uh, yes, and with that, I would uh, acknowledge my team. And uh, yeah, if I forgot anyone, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Thank you for attending. Questions? Uh, great talk. Um, I have a questions, uh, question about have you guys explored the effect of other kinds of antibiotics, like tuning uh, the uh, reversibility or K on K off ratio? I, okay. I love that you asked that question because I just, when I was sitting there, I prepared the slide. Uh, so um, th this is taken from the from the from the dye paper, and you see here you see different antibiotics. So for uh, tetracycline, aromycin, it kind of works the same. But once you add like fusidic acid and MOOP, you, have, uh, you, you, change, you change this phenomena that you, with anti increasing antibiotic concentration, your translation rate goes up. For MOOP, it's not necessarily so surprising that it's so different because it, it, uh, it's inhibit uh, tRNA charging. So it doesn't actually bind to the ribosome. For fusidic acid, it's weird because it's so fluorinfenical, um, stops the peptide bond formation, and fusidic acid stop the translocation of the ribosome. So it's basically the next step, which I think, in my point of view, should be the same. <laughs> but it's uh, Boris shaking his head. <laughs> and, uh, oh. and essentially, in turn, it does prevent the translocation event as such, right? But it also inhibits by soaking up translocation elongation factors G that could translocate other ribosomes. Essentially, by blocking one, it blocks further ones. But, but wouldn't that then be basically the same mechanism than before? Because you have, you reduce your elongation factors. Uh -huh, right. Not necessarily. Yes, yeah, you're affecting the active ones. And, uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the, the, so fusidic acid uh, also uh, in, um, interacts with recycling. But uh, so you would, you also have this double effect where you stop initiation. That would be also interesting how, and I think Bohr worked on this with uh, how uh, you have the two effects that you have uh, an antibiotic that acts on initiation and elongation, and then how this, this changes. One more question. If there are not, let's thank the speaker again.